think. All right. All right. Oh yeah. So first thing I wanted to do was to give you like this high level kind of overview. There is the real world, right? In the real world, we approximate, or not we, but like genius people in the 17th and 18th and 19th century by equations of motion, right? And those are the guys like Newton, that was Hook, right? All these guys were like in the 1600s, then came Lagrange in the 1700s. And then there was Hamilton, which uh, came up with the Hamilton form, Hamiltonian formalism, that was actually in 1833. So those are all just like mathematical tools, right? And what we will, and what we are doing, the background here is that we will ultimately move to numerical methods. And those, of course, only came to popularity when computers were invented. Right, so that's very much 1900s. And there is, and there is, there is like very interesting relationships between the two because the numerical methods, ideally, they would solve the equations of motion exactly, but that's usually impossible. So you have to do some compromises. But to be able to do educated compromises, we first have to understand a little bit about the, the equations of motion themselves. So that's what we will continue on doing today. Today, I'd like to talk about conservation laws. But before we get there, I wanted to clarify one uh, simplifying assumption I'm making here in an attempt to simplify the formulas, okay? And that's the assumption of unit masses. Unit masses, basically. Even if you have a system of particles, then I always say, okay, let's just assume that each of them has mass one, okay? And that might seem like a very restrictive assumption, but it's actually not the case. Why? Because even if I write a simple Newton equations of motion in, or equations of motion in Newton's form, then if I put the masses back in, then they look like this, right? This is the M inverse, so that would be some mass matrix, and here would be the forces. Let's just assume uh, position-dependent forces. So this thing, so the force vector could be give, giving us N by 1 vector, and this mass matrix would be an N by N matrix, okay? It's a typically diagonal matrix, doesn't always have to be diagonal. In some finite element models, you can have a non-diagonal matrix, but even in finite elements, you usually end up doing mass lumping, so it is a diagonal matrix. So essentially what it says is the mass of every particle, and that's those are on the diagonal, okay? And uh, of course, you can, as, as you know, you can write the force as minus gradient, of um, energy if we assume the force is conservative that's what we are going to be assuming uh, for a while so that's that's equivalent right so if we assume that the masses are constant then i can as well take the mass matrix away and that's that's essentially my justification for why we can just deal with unit masses okay and in physics based animation it is okay to assume that m is constant okay as i mentioned before you would only need to worry about changing masses if you are simulating something like rockets or something where the masses are changing with time okay it very rarely happens in physics based animation so usually this this m is is constant and meaning not changing with time okay like a rocket clearly makes sense right because it burns some fuel it's actually mostly fuel that that goes away so the mass of the rocket changes so if you wanted to do rocket science then you have to worry about the the, the masses if uh, that's not what we are going to do so what we can what we can do instead essentially is to say that the masses are built into the potential right we can easily say that we define new potential e tilde x or equivalently into the forces right which will be defined as m inverse of the original potential Okay, because the potential is arbitrary, right? You so said that can be any differentiable function, can be a potential function. So we can as well build the masses in it as long as they are constant. If they are not constant, then we would introduce time dependence into the potential. We don't want to do that. But if they are constant, as I assumed here, then it's then it's good. Also, watch watch this. I figured out that I can be pointing just with just with this. <laughs> 
All right, so that was just to clarify that the simplifying assumption we are making is not really that uh, restrictive, okay? All right, so let's uh, quickly recap Hamilton's equations in arbitrary dimension. Just to get back on track. So they look like this, uh, z dot t equals j gradient of h z of t. And now you should already remember, I hope, what these symbols mean. So what was the z thing? What is the Z? I mean, so those are Hamilton equations. We need to understand what the symbols mean. That's the same thing we uh, discussed uh, the last times. So I'm testing if you remembered it. <laughs> correct, correct, exactly. Thanks, uh, Trevor, right? X and V, exactly. And it's time dependent vector. Okay, so the dimension of this is 2n, and it depends on time. That's why I'm writing this little t there, okay? And I guess I should clarify exactly what this stacking means, just to be, just to be completely clear, right? So this xt will be a n-dimensional vector. So if, when I write this, what I really mean is, is this. So I take the first component of the vector, the second, and so on up to the nth one, okay? And then I do the same thing with the velocities. That's how that looks like, okay? You could also stack it there in a different way. You could do x1, v1, x2, v2, and so on. That would be another possibility, and you would get the same equations mm -hmm. just reordered. Uh, by the way, this x1 and x2, they can also be vectors themselves so they can be two or three dimensional vectors okay because if you will have particles in two or three dimensions typically you have three dimensional system right so they they then all, all of them have x y and z components in which case you can imagine that this each of the xi's themselves is actually a three dimensional vector okay or it can be two dimensional vector if you're doing something like angry birds and it's just a 2d flatland kind of simulation that's that's totally fine Okay, so I will, I will still stick with this n convention that n is the number of degrees of freedom. The n could be 3m or 2m, where m would be the number of your particles, okay? Or, or, or 2d, or it, can, or it can be a scalar, right? The point of the Hamilton's equation is that the x, t's are your degrees of freedom, and the v's are... Uh, the velocities of the degrees of freedom. So you always have the two, that's really the point. By the way, what I'm doing here, I'm doing it on Euclidean spaces. Again, just not to unnecessarily complicate things, but you don't have to be doing it on Euclidean spaces. You could be doing it on manifolds, right? And that corresponds to rigid body physics or articulated rigid bodies, in which case these, these, this, the state vector x would not be just positions in an Euclidean space, but they could be rotations too. And they have a little different, little trickier geometry than the position. So we won't go there yet. But if you want it, you could do that. James? So you're saying set up, setting up a manifold is a way of building constraints, mechanical constraints into your equation? Uh, so the question is that instead of setting up a manifold, you can build a constraints. No, into I'm saying is that a way of building Ah, right, right, right. What you are, um, I think, referring to is the maximal versus minimal coordinates approach, right? The well, well, for example, like, like if you're if you have like a relative joint, mm -hmm. you can only move that, that mm -hmm. body in certain ways. With, I'm not. I guess I'm not familiar with that. But you, but you are absolutely right. So the question is, if you have like a, like a, like maybe I can draw it here, like a, like a robot thing here, right? And it can, yeah. it, it has like a revolute joint here. So yeah. and maybe it only is like one, only one degree of freedom, and that would be the angle alpha, right? So you are right. That's exactly the case where this would not be an Euclidean space, right? Or it would be. Uh, you would you would be looking at the manifold of configurations of the robot. That that could be some angles. And you can imagine that lives on some manifold. And my point was that you can you can formulate the Hamilton's equations or Lagrange equations or Newton's equation in that form. 
but uh, that's not what we do here. Here I will just assume it's the standard Euclidean space to make things easier. If you want to do like articulated bodies, like character thing, that, then, then that's what you do. But maybe we can, we can discuss about that later. For now we can stay in the Euclidean space. So I guess the, the simplest model kind of case which you can think about which I usually have in mind is a, a system of m particles in two or three dimensions and the particles can be connected together with some structural elements like springs or tetrahedrons in finite elements so it's some some object like this so I was just uh, telling you that this is not the most general form because then that would get that could get unruly <laughs> This is a simplified uh, thing, but still generally enough to do lots of interesting physics-based things. Okay, so what was the, so well, let's let's go. So the Z, that's what the Z was, right? The Z dot T, that means the time derivative of this. So it means the time derivative of the positions and velocities, obviously. So that's also a two-dimensional, uh, two n-dimensional vector, again, dependent on time, right? What was the J matrix? Remember that? That's a very important matrix. It's a constant matrix. It's a 2n by 2n matrix. So that matrix has 0, identity, minus identity, and 0. Okay? And each of these four things themselves is an n by n matrix. Okay? So this guy here, it's kind of, I wish this was smaller. <laughs> this 0 is an n by n matrix full of zeros. This is an n by n matrix. I have just an identity, again, n by n matrix of zeros, this is an n by n matrix with minus identity, okay? Just to be very clear. So the gradient of the, so the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is just the sum of a potential energy, potential function Ex, plus the kinetic energy, they are separated in this way, the Ex can be whatever, okay, it just needs to be differentiable or uh, ideally twice differentiable for some of the results we will need the twice differentiable and the kinetic energy since I said we assume unit masses is just this okay so in that case the gradient of the Hamiltonian that's what you'll be using a lot today so the gradient means differentiate by all the variables the Hamiltonian has right it has the x variables and the v variables so the first part of the gradient is differentiating by x, by the positions, and the second part is uh, differentiating by velocities, right? And it's kind of easy to see what that is. That's the gradient of the potential, of course, because the kinetic energy does not depend on x. And, ooh, <clears throat> and the gradient by the velocities, that's just b. So I think we, we had all this before. I just wanted to remind you of the notation and what, what, what are the dimensions of all these things. The first thing when you see an expression like this, you should wonder what the dimensions of those things are, right? Just a quick question. Yep. Why is the gradient of the, um, why is the gradient of the kinetic energy just Oh, okay. So the question is why is the gradient of the kinetic energy just B? So the kinetic energy is defined as one half of v squared, right? So the gradient of this is, I mean, you could also write it as one half v transpose v. So if, if, if you differentiate it, you get just v. You could also write it as sum of vi squares, right? And then do the partial differentiation. And if you want it, I, I prefer to do like the, the vector differentiation straight away. <laughs> okay, thanks. Oh, by the way, and this is what I didn't mention the last time, this, this J, this magical J matrix, this constant matrix that's there. Let's think of for a moment, what is the geometric interpretation of the J? What is it? So first of all, it is a 2n by 2n matrix, right? It's very sparse. It's almost full of zeros. It's something kind of like the identity, but not exactly the identity, right? So what is it geometrically? is the J matrix. Yeah, I heard one first yeah, thing. Like, uh, 
that's a very good insight. It, it indeed is a rotation, but we need to be a little bit careful because we are talking about two n-dimensional rotation, right? So and I know what rotation means 2D and 3D, what rotation means in 2ND. <laughs> and there is a good answer to it, right? So if you just want to elaborate on that. <laughs> Sorry? No, just just um, the uh, understanding what does the G matrix do? What what is it? You are absolutely right. It's it, it's a rotation, yeah. right? But some people might be confused by the concept of rotation in two n dimensions, right? You cannot really see it, okay. but okay. you can still understand it quite easily. Yeah. Okay, can you please speak a little slower? Okay, so the general form of rotation that means as the first we have time to the minus time to the uh -huh. So that is very evident because we are getting zero dimensional the sign and minus sign, so which means mm -hmm. that if each side is twenty degree, then you get like for to be zero and sign to be one. So that's why in two D case this is two D two D matrix, two plus two and plus two in matrix, that's why it's in two D case actually. Yep. Yeah, so the rotation along with um oh <laughs> Only one degree of rotation there, so that's why it has a definition that way. But since it's just 2D, so that's why it's just we have to say that it's 2 and plus 2. You are absolutely right let me say it again for the recording and for 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 everybody so the idea i guess maybe the easiest way to understand it is that you could easily reorder but just by changing the order of rows and columns j to this form where you would have um, 0 1 minus 1 0 here then you would have another 0 1 minus 1 0 here right and and so on right Everybody sees that you could trivially reorder this, right? That would actually correspond to this other possible layout for the Z vector that would correspond to this layout, right? The X1, V1, X2, V2, and so on up to Xn, Vn, right? The layout is kind of arbitrary. It's just the order of the equations and the unknowns, which clearly doesn't matter, right? And from this, you can clearly see that those those guys are just like Ankara was saying, those are just minus 90 degree rotations in two dimensions, okay? So what you can see is you can I guess the easiest way to see this the J would be as a composition of individual 2D rotations, each acting in a two-dimensional subspace of the two n-dimensional space. Okay, that's like a very uh, complicated way of saying that it rotates every x i v i independently by minus 90 degrees. Okay. So that's why I also started with the toy case, if you remember, that was exactly the rotation by minus 90 degrees, and that, that was it. But the rotation by minus 90 degrees is, is in some sense essential to how the mechanics in this world behaves. And that's what Hamilton discovered. And probably people before him too. Hamilton is credited for these, for these equations. All right. So if this is clear, we can move into conservation laws. And the motivation for that is that in our toy case, we have seen that the energy was conserved, right? If you remember, we got some expression like, like this when we computed the Hamiltonian, the total energy. I'll just use the terms interchangeably. The total energy in the Hamiltonian is the same as far as I'm concerned. If you ask if physicists, they might disagree, but as far as I'm concerned, it is the same, right? So when we computed the Hamiltonian as a function of time for our toy case, we found it was conserved, right? So we can be asking ourselves, is this always true? Is the Hamiltonian always constant for any potential E, okay, for whatever potential, not just for our toy cases, and also for any dimension N, right, not just for N equals 1. And if it is, which, uh, and, and if it is, we can be asking, are there other conserved quantities? Oops, come on. some other invariants of motion, some other functions that don't change as the motion goes on, okay? So the answer to the first question is yes. 
as long as the potential is time invariant and, and the forces are conservative, but that's what we assume here. And the answer to the second question is sometimes, depending on the potential. Okay. Does anybody have an idea what, what else could be conserved in addition to the total energy? Uh, so the answer is momenta, linear and angular momentum. And that's conserved sometimes, and that's what I would like to explain. Uh, that's what I'd like to talk about today. So we start with the definition of a first integral. Okay, that's an, that's an abstract tool that will um, allow us to better understand all these conservation laws. Okay, so we'll say that a phase space function, function f, so what I mean by phase space function, I mean that it maps from the phase space, oops, sorry, it's 2n to r. So every point in the phase space, every z, it assigns a real value, okay? And we say it's is a first integral. I did not come up with this terminology. I just took it over from physics books. I don't know why they call it first integral. It's sometimes also called the, the invariant or constant of motion, okay? And the condition is as follows. is for every z from the phase space, it is true that the gradient of f at that point z transposed times the j gradient of the Hamiltonian at z equals zero, okay? So that's a definition. So what this, what this thing is saying is that the gradient, so this is a scalar function, it returns a scalar, it's a function defined on the phase space, okay? And this definition says that for that to be a first integral, it needs to be orthogonal to the, the j gradient of the Hamiltonian, right? As you, that's of course, we, we, we have these equations of motion, so that's the same thing as z dot t. So you can intuitively, geometrically think about it, that the function f cannot vary in, in, in directions of the motion, okay? This is kind of hand way I will make that statement precise. And that, that also, that's also like explains why it's defined like this, okay? So I guess I can call it like a lemma, if you will, to make it a little more structured. So the lemma says that if f is a first integral, and I have a function a motion, so from time to phase space, okay, which satisfies Hamilton's equations. Then, that's the statement of the lemma, then f z of t is constant. Okay, so that kind of gives you why is it defined like this, it tells you why is it defined like this, why the first integral is also uh, an invariant of motion, basically means that the function f does not change during the course of the motion. Okay, so this, this z will be for some initial conditions, I don't care what the initial conditions are, right? The initial conditions will influence what this constant is, but they don't change the fact then the first integral along the entire motion is constant, okay? And the idea of the why, why I'm saying this first integral thing, the idea is then that the linear angular momenta and even energy itself are examples of first integrals, okay? So first let's prove this. It's actually embarrassingly simple to prove it. Just to see if, I'm, if you are with me, what do, how, how do you think we would prove this? Or is it clear, the definition and the statement? Might be easy to get lost in this because it gets a little mathy, so don't be don't be shy to ask. <laughs> so I need to prove this, right? I need to prove so this f z of t. Well, that's just a that's a composition of functions, right? Z is one function, f is another function, right? So, and actually it, it, will, it will be returning a scalar function, right? So that's some, so some value I'm measuring during the course of the motion, OK? 
okay? That's how it gets abstract. Those values can be linear angular momenta or can be the energy itself, okay? And what I want to prove is that this composite function, the f of z of t, where t is time, of course, is constant, okay? So the proof has this, uh, I will be actually repeating the same structure of the proof over and over again. British, you had some idea? You are exactly right. Perfect, Radish. Thanks. That's exactly how you prove it. It's it's very simple proof. It's basically the reason why the definition was created this way. So let me repeat that in, in writing here. So what are we are going to do? We're going to time differentiate this function f of z of t. So I guess the only thing you need to know here to be able to do this is the chain rule. Okay. So I just write it, sometimes we write it with the dot, the time differentiation, I just wrote it as a partial derivative with respect to time here, just to make the notation a little bit clearer. So, and then how does chain rule work? Well, the chain rule, do, does everybody remember the multivariate chain rule? So yes, okay, so I, I see you. So it's better to write it than say it, I think. So it's the gradient of f at that same point, fz of t. This whole thing needs to get transposed and dot product it with the derivative of the argument, okay? In which case that's z dot of t, okay? One like immediate urge is to check the dimensions, right? So what's the dimension of the gradient of f? Well, it needs to be, uh, and I transpose it, right? So it will be one times two n. Just to, just to do a sanity check if we are having it right, right? And the z was a function from time to r to n. So if the, the moment I give it time, this will become a 2n by one dimensional vector. So indeed, I do a scalar, okay? So this little t here means a dot product. And that's just a textbook application of the chain rule, all right? Everybody cool with that? All right, and then just as British said, the next thing we are going to do, we are going to use the fact that Z satisfies Hamilton's equations, okay? If Z satisfies Hamilton's equation, that means that the time derivative of Z is equal to this, the J gradient of the Hamiltonian, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy the first term, so the gradient of F of Z of T transpose, that's the same thing, but now I will put there the J gradient of the Hamiltonian at Z. And then I'll be like, aha, that's exactly how we define it in the first place. We said that for every Z, oh, I guess I should have written Z of T to be formally correct. But that's exactly how we defined it, so that's that's zero, right? So done. That's That's how the first integral was defined, really. The reason why we have this definition there is that th then it will be easier to check whether a function is a first integral, okay, or constant of motion. When you hear physicists talking about constant of motion, that sometimes they sometimes also mean constant of motion that can depend on time, okay. I and physicists can talk about all sorts of things and quantum mechanics and so on. We will not be doing that, okay? So for here, the constants of motion mean that they do not depend on time, right? This this function is purely a function of phase space. So it cannot evolve itself in time. That will get more complicated. Let's not go there, at least not yet. All right, so now do you understand the concept of the first integral? It's like an abstract tool that will let us study what things are conserved during a motion. Okay, so let's. Uh, so the next thing I would like to do is to go over a few examples of first integrals, the, the most important examples. So do you know what is the first, uh, most obvious and clearly most important example of a first integral? I think I said it before even. That is true, but that's not the first most obvious one. And linear momentum is a first integral only under certain assumptions, not always. Okay, so that will be a little bit trickier. So I first want to get the, the most uh, obvious suspect out of the way. <laughs> you are right, Junior, exactly. The Hamilton in itself is a first integral. That's exactly right. <clears throat> And we'll prove it in just a second. I'll just write it down first. So Hamiltonian itself is a first integral. 
maybe I can also to make it like math I will make this into a lemma. The lemma and proofs is not to scare you, but to give it give it some structure. <laughs> all right. So first of all, the Hamiltonian. What is the Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian is a function from R to N from the phase space, and every point in the first space it assigns a number, right? So you can see that this type matches. So that's that's good, right? That's that's I guess what you were thinking. That that makes it an ideal candidate, right? And that's what we said before, right? That we said that the total energy, aka the Hamiltonian, is conserved. Uh, under under these assumptions. So how do we prove this? Our proof is kind of obvious, right? What are we gonna do to prove it? We need to verify, or no, someone someone else can say that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we need we need to prove this, right? That's 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 the condition, and that needs to be satisfied for every z in the phase space, for every vector of positions and velocities. All right. So how do we do this? Well, so what we are gonna do? So this f now becomes the h. Ah, that's what you were saying. Okay, got you now. <laughs> yes, exactly. So this f becomes the h, and we'll write it out, and we will see what happens. Okay. So I will put instead of the f now, I put there the h. So I have the gradient of the Hamilton and transpose the funny J matrix. Some people call it Poisson matrix, the J's. Maybe I could call it Poisson too. Uh, and gradient H. And please forgive me not writing there the Z everywhere. The Z, the Z is everywhere except for the J because the J is constant, okay? So then what is the gradient of the Hamiltonian? That's what we, uh, I guess it doesn't even matter what exactly that is, but we know what it is, right? It's the gradient of the potential transposed and the velocity transposed. We know what the J matrix is, so that's the that's this funny two n dimensional rotation, right? And if I write out this, so this is the gradient of the potential and the V, all right? So what do we get? I will copy this part, so that's the transpose gradient of the potential, aka minus forces, okay? And here I will carry out the matrix multiplication, so I will get a V and a minus gradient of E. Okay, so I'm left with a dot product, and if I do the dot product, let's see if I can squeeze it in here, V minus V transpose the gradient of E. Okay, and what is this? That is zero, right? Because these things, you know, of course, that A, T, B is the same thing as B, T, A. Why? Give me a one sentence linear algebra argument or this several different ways you could argue, I guess. It's a basic thing. That's the fact I use here, right? One came out transpose, I'll be using that all the time. So just to clarify that. Someone you Yeah, I mean, sure, you can look at the dot product as a multiplication of special type of matrices, like 1 by n and n by 1 matrix multiplied together, for sure, yeah. But matrix multiplication is... Well, there's the transposition, which matters there, too, right? Because one one is the transpose of the other, right? There, there are several ways you can argue this is true. You can just also write it out, right, because this... This thing is the sum of AI, BI, and this, this thing is the sum of BI, AI, so no, no surprise they are the same. You can also look at this as this being a one by one matrix. So the transposition of a one by one matrix is the matrix itself. Or if you want to look at it more abstractly in, in, in linear algebra, then you can say that the scalar, uh, sorry, dot product is commutative by, by definition. So I hope this is clear and that I can write this and conclude that this is zero, thereby concluding that this is satisfied when I took f to be equal to Hamiltonian itself. So indeed, we have finished the proof that the Hamiltonian is a first integral. Okay, so that proves that the Hamiltonian, the total energy, is conserved for any system under our assumptions of unit masses and the potential not depending on time. Okay, these are the standard assumptions. So if I want to write it formally, the conclusion is that the h of z of t 
will be always the same as the Hamiltonian of the initial conditions. Okay, so the system starts with some initial energy. It can be either be pre-stretched or it can have some initial velocities, and that energy stays for the entire duration of the motion. Okay, that's the consequence of our assumptions that the forces don't vary in time and that they are conservative. The energy, the mechanical energy doesn't have anywhere to go. And here, here you see it mathematically. Okay. All right, so that was the easiest example of a first integral. Let's look into other examples of first integrals, okay? So the first one will be linear momentum, as Brian suggested. <clears throat> but linear momentum will not be always conserved, okay? It will require certain special properties of the potential function. Okay, so let's work out, maybe let's go another page. Let's basically work out in terms of an example, okay. Let's say, let's assume that we are in 3D, 3D system, okay. Let's assume that we have m particles. So our n equals 3m, because for each of the particles I have the x, y, and z coordinates, okay. And let's assume that our potential function E of X is invariant to translations along the X axis. Axis X, okay. So the first thing I have to do is to formulate this mathematically, what this invariant. So first of all, what does it mean intuitively? If I have a system whose potential is invariant to translations in the x-axis, so I'm in 3D, I have three axes, right? I, oh, I should probably draw it rather than acting it, so it's recording too, right? So I have um, x, y, z axes, right? The pot uh, what I'm saying is the potential doesn't change if I translate the whole system along the x-axis, okay? Can you... Can you see an example of a potential that would be that would have this property, and also example of potential that would not have this property? <laughs> Can we ask a quick question? Yes, so please I do. We assume, like in the modern world here, if I have my hand here, mm -hmm. versus here, the potential is the same because the gravitational so, distance is equal. Is that what you're talking about here? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So the potential is, is an abstract function. Which, which, which defines in basically what direction the for, what forces, what conservative forces will be acting on the system, right? And you said that gravity is a perfect example of this, right? You, let's assume the simple linear gravity model, like the MGH, right? When the G is the gravity constant, and it points along a certain direction, right? So typically, let's say that the gravity points in the Y direction. So this is like our ground, like small slice of the Earth, right? If you get an apple, as Newton observed, that's not it. Apple, then it then it falls down in the direction of the y-axis. Okay, so Brian, you are totally right that this is an if the, just the gravity potential is an example of a potential that's invariant to translations along the x-axis. Okay, it is clearly not invariant. Uh, with respect to translation about the y-axis, right? Because if I move it up and down in the y-axis, then the potential energy changes, right? James? So we can think of this world as having just being like some sort of like the gravitation gravitation is some sort of like cylindrical world along x, but it's a charge along x that's creating this potential e of x. Oh, I mean, so the I guess I can be precise what I mean by this. So here the the gravity potential. I mean, maybe write it. It's really the simplest gravity model, like, or maybe capital G to be a little nicer. Because if it's invariant along x, it varies along x and z, right? So anything moving away, away from or towards x will change in some way, right? Yeah, it's also, it's also so this, this is, okay, so to, to settle this discussion, <laughs> I, this is the potential we had in mind. I, I believe Ryan had the same potential in mind, M, MGY, okay? So, so I, can, I can get rid of the M because let's say that we assume that the masses are one. So the G would be the gravity constant, right? Like the 9.81, whatever, doesn't matter, that's a constant. And the Y, that's the Y axis. Okay. Clear enough, that doesn't, that doesn't change along the X and Z axes. I kind of 
didn't mention the z-axis but that's that's the deal so the potential you could even visualize it right some sort of like field that that grows as you go higher up in the y-axis right okay yeah the by the way the now and now is a good skiing remark kind of thing we would all rather be skiing today so the the fact that the mechanical energy is conserved that the hamiltonian is constant that's very well visible in skiing right because if you go up the mountain by a lift then you increase your potential energy and then for the rest of the ride what you are doing you are transferring it in, into a kinetic energy right and there is dissipation, of course, the contact between the skis and the snow. That's how you actually release that energy away, probably turn it into displacement of snow or something like this. So that's where the energy is lost. But if the conditions are like really good, like it's been groomed and your skis are nice and nice and waxed and so on, then the energy will be like almost conserved. So if you were like go up, go up on a hill, right, and start skiing down, and there was another hill there, then you would you would come up to the same level. So it would still conserve the energy. The energy tr essentially transforms very easily from the potential to the kinetic one. That's essentially what the Hamilton's equation describe, but stays conserved unless there is dissipation, which there always is in the real world, but we are now discussing the idealized situation without dissipation. Okay? All right. So let's get rid of this and work out... Work out the momentum. What does that mean? <clears throat> okay, so first of all, I have to express this mathematically, right? So let me call, let me define a vector u1, okay? And I'll say this vector will look like this. It will be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on up to 1, 0, 0, okay? So this means um, it's still an n-dimensional vector, okay? But here I said that the n equals 3m, Okay, so I have m of these blocks, each of three. Okay, so that's exactly to measure the displacement about the x-axis. And then I can say the same thing mathematically by saying that the e x plus alpha u1 must be equal to e of x for every um, x and for every alpha. Here the alpha is a scalar. Okay, the x and u1 are n-dimensional vectors. All right. So that's a mathematical way of saying the same thing. That's saying that the, I assume the potential is invariant to translations about the x-axis. Okay. And the u1, this u1 vector, the, the one is like for x. I could have u2 and u3 for y and z. Right. So the u1 kind of tells me in what direction is it is it invariant. So what that means if if, if I have my x vector and that stacks the x y z coordinates of the first particle, x y z coordinates of second particle, and so on, then this means that I'm translating just the x coordinates of all the particles. Okay. And this means this is the the invariance. This says that whenever I do this translation of the x coordinates all by the same amount, all by the amount alpha, then I don't have any change in the potential. The potential doesn't care about that, okay? So like an example, if you want a specific example, if I was in this, if I had still the gravity potential as before, acting along the y-axis, right? And I have some system of some particles connected with some, with some connective elastic things, okay? Then this means that I translate all of the particles by the same amount alpha. Okay, so that seems quite reasonable, right? Imagine you had some deformable object or a human body, anything really, right? You translate it in a, in a gravitational field, you don't change the potential, right? If you're traversing while skiing, you're certainly not changing your potential energy. So the, so the gravity is invariant to this. It satisfies exactly this formula. All right, so let's... Um, but you is like a selection vector for the variables. Right, right. Yep, yep. I could have, I could have u two, which would be like a translation about the y axis, right? In that case, I would instead of one zero zero, I would I would put zero one zero, and I could have u three for the z axis. It would be zero zero one repeated all the time. Is that clear? 
By the way, whatever I will be doing now doesn't kind of doesn't depend on what the U1 is. Okay, this is just to give you a specific idea what we are talking about. All right. So the first thing we are gonna do, let's let's guess guess what we are gonna do. We are gonna differentiate this expression by alpha. Okay. So what do I get if I differentiate this by alpha? Huh? Not really. So first of this, this is a scalar function of alpha. If I uh, so let's assume that x and u1 is fixed. Okay. U1 is always fixed, let's assume x is fixed as well. And look at this as a function of alpha. That's what I mean if I say differentiate by alpha, that means that everything else is fixed, like a partial derivative kind of thing, right? And just alpha varies. And what's gonna be the, the derivative? What's gonna be the change of this function as I vary alpha? Zero, exactly, of course. So I can write it like this, right? Zero equals the partial derivative by alpha of e x plus alpha u1. Why is it zero for everybody? Is that clear? Because it doesn't change, right? Because exactly because of this property, right? No matter what alpha I put there, I'm always getting ex. The function is constant in alpha. That means the derivative by alpha is zero. All right. So uh, then let's do the chain rule again, and we will see an interesting property that will then help us prove the conservation of linear momentum. Or what I'm trying to get to is to prove that the linear momentum uh, along the x-axis is a first integral. That's what I'm trying to get to. So the first step is to apply the chain rule here again. And the chain rule will give me this, that the gradient of E and the same thing, of course, x plus alpha u1, the whole thing transposed, times u1. And we uh, so that's that's again applying the chain rule, okay, to, to this expression. So I do the gradient, then I differentiate by then I differentiate by alpha, and I get the u1. Okay, so that's again a dot product. So from this, if I if I compare, so on the one hand I know this must be zero. On the other hand, I know that that's this. So I have to conclude that this dot product must be zero. Okay. And let's think, um, and maybe let me give you an intuition for what that dot product means. Let me drop, let me drop this argument here to make it a little bit simpler. Or does anybody have a physics intuition of what this dot product means? Remember that the, the derivatives of the potential, those are forces. Okay. Let's just say that alpha equals zero to make it a little bit simpler so that the gradient at x, that this is true for any alpha, right? So definitely also for alpha equals zero. So we know that this is true, right? And let me, uh, I can rewrite this, right? This, this, this dot product. I can rewrite it by particle. So I can go from my particles from one to m. I said I have m particles. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of nice, you can still see that. And I can see that this is the differentiation by ith particle. Of the potential i um, times and now the now will be just the three-dimensional part of u1 which is just one zero zero that's the this is like somebody said correctly the selection of the x component okay so this thing is minus force acting on the ith particle okay minus f i x okay dot producted by one zero zero Okay, going again from all for all particles. So do you see what that means? That means that all the x coordinates of all the forces sum to zero. Okay, so if I look at all the forces acting on my particles, I pick their x coordinate, I sum them all together, I must get zero. Okay? That follows from the translation invariance of the potential along the x-axis, okay? And that leads us to the to uh, the first integral. Then watch this. Then I, if I define, maybe I can also make it like a lemma, right? Ah, that's not complicated. I'll just make it informally. So then if I define this function, p1 z equals z t 0 u1 and then I claim under these assumptions this is a first integral 
the function p1 defined like this. So again, I of course assume that the p1 is a function on the phase space, right, from r to n to r, so it returns a scalar. The scalar is computed as the dot product, dot product between the phase space state, the z, and the 0 and u1. Of course, this assumes this 0 is a 2n dimensional 0, right, u1, u1 is, is this u1, that's still the same thing. And I claim this is the first integral, and this, this first integral is exactly the linear momentum uh, along the y-axis, okay? So does, uh, do you see the relationship to linear momentum? For this you need to remember what the z was, right? The z is a phase space vector, so it's a concatenation of positions and velocities, right? And notice that there's this funny zero I put there. So do you see the relationship to linear momentum? So what is the linear momentum? You must have had this in some high school physics. <laughs> Specifically, I'm talking about the total linear momentum of the entire system, right? This, as, I, as I was drawing before, I have some system which may have a bunch of particles, right? They might be connected in some funny ways. There might be some gravity acting on it. That's, that's, that's all good. So what you probably remember from some basic physics classes is that the linear momentum is the sum of all velocities multiplied by masses. That's the total linear momentum. I assume to simplify things that the masses are one, so it's really just the sum of velocities. Okay? Well, guess what? That's exactly that's exactly what I wrote here, right? This is exactly what the P1 is. Because the Z T because the Z T is the X T V T, right? If I dot product it, that's why that's why I put the zero thing here, right? Because then this will be exactly equal to V T U1. And what does the dot product do? It will sum all the x components of the velocities. Okay. Well, let's let's prove that this is a first integral. And the way we do it is the, is, the, is the same way as before, right? So let's remember what was the definition of a first integral. This was right. So now I have this function p1, which will now be substituted for f, and I need to prove this thing here. Okay. So let's do that. So what I need to prove is that the gradient of P1 transpose times the Poisson matrix times the gradient of the Hamiltonian will be zero, okay? So the first thing I need to realize, what is the gradient of P1? That's actually something quite simple. Because the function P1, actually, what is the function P1? What type of function is it? It's a very simple kind of function, right? It's a linear function on the phase space, okay? Because the argument of the function does that, this is just a dot product. It's a linear function on phase space, okay? If, it, if the phase space was two-dimensional, like in our 1D case, then you can imagine it as, as some sort of like plane, planar height field passing through, having zero at exactly at zero. Right? It's obvious that if z was exactly zero, then the p1 will be zero too. So that's a linear function on the phase space. Okay, so what's the gradient of a linear function? Mm -hmm. And what that constant is? It's, it's written right here. <laughs> that's what it is, right? A zero u1, exactly. So that's zero you want. That's the gradient of P1. All the partial derivatives stacked together but just a linear function. So that's what it is. So let's plug it in there and see what we get. So the, now we transpose it, right? So this is the zero transposed, U1 transposed. Now we know what the J gradient of H is, right? I think we were uh, writing it somewhere. Did we not write it somewhere? Okay, I, I wrote what the gradient of H is here. So I can also write here what the great, uh, what the G. Oh, was it there? I mean, yeah, ah, let me write it here, I can. 
j gradient of h so that is just v and the minus gradient of e okay so i will grab this and i'll put it in here so this is as i said that's b and minus gradient of e okay aka forces minus gradient of e okay so I do the dot product, so that's that's why I put this zero here, right? Because then this B goes away, and I am left with U1 transpose minus U1 transpose the gradient of E, okay? But guess what? That's exactly what we figured out here is zero, okay? So indeed, if we assume that the potential is translation invariant in the UI, in the UI direction, then the P1 is a first integral, meaning it's constant during the course of the motion. Okay, so that's where you get linear momentum conservation. And it's only conditional, it's only if the potential has this translation invariance. Okay. And you can notice if, if you if you look at all, all this stuff you can notice that never I have to except for like this uh, uh, inter interpretation of what this means I never had to use the specific form of the u1 okay so I can plug different different vectors there too and I will get the same conclusion okay so for any u1 you will get so for any, for any, I guess you, I could say, if you have the invariance of the potential by translations along the U direction, then you can conclude that the function defined like this is a first integral. So the corresponding momentum is conserved, okay? And why I'm making so complicated because, because like we saw in the gravity potential, you will have the X and Z linear momentum conserved, but not the Y, okay? If you don't have gravity, if you are somewhere in outer space, then uh, you can easily have like an elastic potential where all three linear momenta, x, y, and z, are conserved, okay? That, that basically boils down to Newton's first law of motion, that in that case, if you are somewhere far away in space, then the object moving with a constant velocity will keep moving with that velocity forever. That's a different way of stating a linear momentum conservation, okay? That's violated if there are some external forces acting on it, like the gravity, which will violate the conservation along the direction of which is it acting. Okay, so now here you hear, but here you see precisely the math, how to derive that conservation business. So the next thing I want to, to so is this clear? It's a little mathy, I know, but that's kind of the point that we don't just like hand wave about the momenta conservation, but I wanted to give you the hard math on, on, on it. So the next thing I wanted to do was uh, angular momentum. So that will be our last example of a first integral, integ integral uh, linear momentum, sorry, angular momentum. The reason why I want to do this is because it's a little bit trickier than the linear momentum, as you know from graphics or robotics, or when you go from linear transformations to like translations, that's not the right way to say it. Whenever you go to rotations, things get a little bit more complicated, okay? Because rotations are fundamentally a quadratic thing, which does not have any linear structure to it. It has some other structure to it, group structure to it, which is exactly what we'll use here to talk about angular momentum. So for linear momentum, we needed the translation invariance of the potential. What do you think we will need? What assumption on the potential we will need for angular momentum to be conserved? Exactly, rotation invariance. So let's talk about rotation invariance of the potential. And let's make it, let's make it again like an example, let's make it concrete. So let's say with respect to the x-axis again, okay? So intuitively, again, let's assume that we are in 3D, right? So we have x, y, and z axes. 
And let's assume that I have some system such that when I rotate the positions of all the particles of the system about the x-axis, the potential does not change. Okay? So an example of the system would be, for example, like some, let's say, let me see if I can do a good job of drawing it. Let's say I have an elastic cube, which is fixed to the x-axis, okay? And there is no gravity or anything acting on it. There's just internal elastic forces between the particles in, in that cube, okay? So I have some, like, rubbery kind of cube, which I fixed to the x-axis, okay? So if I rotate the entire cube about the x-axis, the the deformation energy stored in that cube, it's an elastic cube, so you can imagine it's like made of lots of springs, so I can store a lot of energy in it by stretching those springs, but if I rotate the entire thing about the x-axis, then the total elastic energy is exactly the same, okay? So that's what means the rotation invariance of the elastic potential with respect to an x-axis. All right, take two. So I wasn't doing anything exciting. I was just writing the rotation matrix. So this is minus sine of alpha. This is zero. Sine alpha and sine of alpha. So this is a rotation about the x-axis by angle alpha, right? Nothing too exciting. Now, in general, I have m particles. So I want to rotate all of them. So I will put this all in a matrix called Q also depending on the angle alpha. And what that will be, will be, well, we'll be just rotating all the particles by the same rotation matrix, okay? The way I put this in a single matrix, I just stack them on a diagonal, okay? So all these guys are, of course, three by three matrices, right? Then I can create this 3M by 3M dimensional matrix where 3M is and the number of my degrees of freedom, okay? And with the setup, I can say that the rotation invariance about the x-axis is formally written as this, as q alpha x, where x is my all, all vector of positions. Then that needs to be the same as e of x for every state x, for every positions s, and for all alphas. Okay, so it's a similar kind of thing like with the translation before, except that now I need a matrix to rotate all of the points. And again, the point is that every single point rotates by the same amount. Okay, kind of like kind of like the situation here, right? Like imagine like an elastic cube. I rotate all of the points by the same angle about the x-axis. And if I'm my potential is rotation invariant, that means that this equality must be true for all alphas. All right. Problem is that I'm running out of time, but let's see how far I can get. So we are going to do the same thing as before. We are going to differentiate this expression, this expression by alpha. Okay. So again, just like before, the derivative of this by alpha is what? Zero, right? Because still, still is constant, right? Now the motion is not linear. Now it's rotation, but doesn't change anything on the fact that if I differentiate this by alpha then I get a zero okay well let's do the same thing as before let's apply the chain rule on on the other side so we'll get some other thing being zero okay and that's what will lead to the angular momentum so again I have the gradient transposed and now I have to differentiate whatever is inside okay so that means I have to differentiate this by alpha and this x is constant that doesn't depend on alpha so I just copy that okay so this is the differentiation by alpha of the interior of the argument of that function again chain rule okay so what is the derivative of q by alpha well, the Q is nothing but a stack of R1s, right? So all I, need to all I need to figure out is what is the alpha derivative of R1. Can somebody tell me what that is? That's kind of simple. Zero, 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 that's right. And zero, and the cosine differentiates to minus sign, exactly. Minus sign differentiates to minus cosine, right? This would be zero sine and again minus mm -hmm. sine right so 
so that's 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 one R1 and then for to differentiate the Q I just copy this on the diagonal of that matrix okay simple so this is true for any alpha okay so there's no need to make things more complicated than necessary so I can plug in alpha equals zero for alpha for alpha equals zero if I put there alpha equals zero I will get this so sine of zero is zero and cosine of zero is one okay so I'll get this matrix okay and I can call this matrix s1 it will be an important matrix and then I can just say then the stack of these S1 matrices on the diagonal will be called S. Okay. So it's the same thing as before. That's a 3M by 3M matrix. Okay. So then I can write this whole thing as follows as the gradient of E transpose. I'm just copying that. And then this S matrix. Okay. Now with plugging in the alpha equals zero, but it's true because it's true for any alpha and x okay and again just like before i can give you uh, i can write it out by this is just to give you an idea what that actually means right i can write it out by components so if i differentiate by individual particles i will get this so this will be by the m particle so again those are negative forces acting on individual particles here is still the s matrix and here are the individual positions x1 to xm okay so each of these guys now is a three-dimensional vector okay 3m okay and now you can see because the s matrix has this block diagonal structure then you can see that you can write this as a sum over all particles from 1 to m okay and here is going to be the force act, minus force acting on each particle times the S1 matrix, so that's just a three by three matrix times XI, okay? So this is one by three thing, this is three by three thing, this is this, is, this, is this. and then there is the X, XI is a three dimensional vector, okay? And now the cool thing, do you know what this, this thing is? Or let me, let me change the symbol slightly. Do you know what A, T, S, 1, B is for A, B being three-dimensional vectors? That's kind of cool. So it's probably not immediately obvious, right? So let me work it out. So I said, so let's see. So if I have some A, which is a three-dimensional vector transposed, and I hit it with the S matrix, which we said is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0. And here is some vector B, B1, B2, B3. Anybody has a guess what that will be? Hmm? Okay. Um, let me just write the hard math to just just work out the product so this is zero this is minus b3 right and this is b2 so this looks like to me it's a3 b2 minus a2 b3 now does that look familiar <laughs> it is kind of a projection but uh, there is one other basic 3d linear algebra concept i'm looking for here It's the first coordinate of the cross product okay if i was gonna do a cross product of a1 a2 and a3 if i was gonna cross it with b1 b2 b3 then you know what you would get right you would get a2 b3 minus b2 a3 right then you would get um, b1 a3 minus a1 b3 and the last one would be a1 b2 minus a2 b1 okay so the thing we have recovered here is up to a minus, which doesn't matter because it will be zero anyway, is exactly this first part of the cross product, okay? And that's essentially what will then lead to the x component of the angular momentum to being conserved. But we will get 
back to it on Tuesday because I'm already slightly over time. <coughs> All right.